Okay, yeah. for our next talk, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Victor Gilliman from MIT, who's going to talk about semi-classical functions of isotropic type. Yep. Yep. So I'll begin by giving some very, very simple examples of these semi-classical functions. They've been around for ages and ages. Um, so oscillatory functions of Lagrange. Would anybody object if I just read what's on the screen and you can see what's on the screen? I, 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 I mean, I have to talk a bit when I give a lecture, so maybe I'll proceed this way. Um, okay, very good. So, um, oscillatory functions of Lagrangian type. So the prototypical example of a oscillatory function of Lagrangian type is this starred function here on this first slide. Uh, um, it, uh, it, uh, it depends on h bar. As you let h bar to uh, tend to zero, this oscillates like crazy but the oscillations are confined to the Lagrangian manifold at the bo bottom of this slide. Maybe I should stand so I can see what the, these, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the Lagrangian manifold on which these oscillatory functions of isotropic type live um, is the Lagrangian manifold consisting of all points X, C and R, N, where C is the derivative of the function f at x. And these are a very, very simple-minded set of examples, but they, they are standard examples in the literature of a set of oscillatory functions of Lagrangian type. Um, that's page one. Page two, the topic of today's lecture by the way, this is joint work uh, of mine with uh, Alex Ariba and Zokin Wang in a paper that just got published about uh, a couple, couple months ago. These are generalizations of these classical oscillatory functions of, of uh, Lagrangian type. And they are known as oscillatory functions of isotropic type. The prototypical example of a function of this type is this double starred function on uh, the screen here. Do, do you guys all have a, are you able to follow this? Do you see this screen? Do you, yeah, okay, good. Um, okay. And the prototypical example of functions of this type are this, these double starred functions on this slide. Um, do I have to say, I mean, you can see that these functions. I, I guess I don't have to define every little detail in this, in this display here. And these functions are oscillatory functions of isotropic type. In other words, you can see that they live microlocally on the isotropic manifold consisting of C prime is DF of x prime zero and c prime prime is equal to zero. So these are um, very nice prototypical examples of oscillatory functions of isotropic type. Incidentally, if anybody has any questions about any of this stuff, please just, you know, Professor Gilman, please, we have some question. Can, can you answer this? Yes. Uh, say it loud. Still I'm still semi classically means semi classical analysis is the study of functions that oscillate like crazy as you let h bar go to zero. And uh, the semi classicity of these describes the nature of these oscillations. Again, let me put the typical example of, of an oscillatory function of Lagrangian type back on this slide. This function y of xh. <coughs> Those functions have been around in physics and applications and mathematics for ages and ages. And uh, that is the prototypical example. Of that. And the things that um, Alex and Zokin and I have been studying are somewhat more refined examples, the star star examples here, which live microlocally on isotropic manifolds, the isotropic manifold in here being 
the one described by the equation C prime is DF at X zero, C prime prime is equal to zero. Any questions? Yes. Is that supposed to correspond with Black's constant? See, I'm, I'm, I'm having a problem. It's supposed to correspond with Black's constant. Is H supposed to correspond with Planck's constant? H is Planck's constant. Dark, Vinyashna. Okay. Remark. To answer your question, in fact, um, in both cases, semi classically means as h bar goes to zero. So these functions oscillate like crazy as h bar goes to zero. And the um, um, isotropic or Lagrangian describes where the oscillations are taking place, description of those oscillations. In this lecture, what I want to do is describe a completely different way of looking at these functions. Uh, um, the oscillatory functions of Lagrangian type have a beautiful description by Hermander, which I'm going to inflict on you in about two or three minutes. Um, and uh, after describing Hermander's beautiful approach for defining oscillatory functions of Lagrangian type, I'm going to alter the description a little bit and tell you about the functions that Alex and Zokin and I have been staring at. Oscillatory functions of isotropy. Any questions, please? If you have any more questions, just inflict them on me. Well, let me now turn to Hermander's a definition of oscillatory functions of Lagrangian type. Okay, X an n-dimensional manifold, Z pi X, a fiber bundle over X. And on this fiber bundle, if you the tangent space to this fiber bundle um, contains a very important subspace, H star Z. It's um, pi pullback by pi star of the uh, cotangent space to Z, uh, to X. This sits inside T star Z. And a typical element is that Z C is in pi pullback of T star X if for X equal pi of Z, C equals D pi Z of eta. Eta sit, sitting as a covector. The last line in, is not in there. Oh, it's not getting, oh. Stream at me if it didn't, okay, here we go. I, okay, please remind me from now on that I, I should, okay, that's the, slowly do it again. Start of the display, on, on, on. The whole display finished. I, I should, I, should I pause here while, you guys try to uh, digest all this notation. It's okay. It's comprehensible. It's comprehensible. Thanks. Um, well, uh, it, from this definition, it's clear. Uh, so the definition again, H star Z is pi pullback of T star of X. And uh, this, H star Z has a very natural projection onto the cotangent space of X. Here's the description of this projection. You all get this. And, and uh, uh, so, so the element, uh, yeah, so we have this completely natural projection down onto T star of X. Now, Hermander's beautiful idea. Here, I'll, I'm gonna say it very slowly because this is one of the key moments in this lecture. Let phi be a C infinity function on Z, uh, a real valued C infinity function. And that lambda phi be the Lagrangian manifold consisting of all points Z, C, in, in the cotangent space of Z, having the property that 
C. Uh, uh, is C is 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 D phi of Z. There should be that should be a Z here inside of T star of Z. Okay, so that's a nice Lagrangian manifold sitting inside of the. Suppose this manifold intersects H star Z transversely. Should I run H, bar, H star Z by you, or did you, did you all get that from the first slide? Uh, um, then modulo some trivial assumptions, blah, 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 on lambda, which I won't specify here, blah, blah, blah. Pi pullback maps H star Z uh, um, intersected with the Lagrangian manifold lambda phi bijectively onto a Lagrangian manifold lambda pi sitting inside of T star X. Pause. Comment. This is a beautiful way, due to Hermander, of defining. Lagrangian, a very general class of Lagrangian submanifolds of T star of X by this projection technology. He wrote a beautiful paper on this subject um, set many, well, many years ago. And uh, lots and lots of people have exploited these ideas ever since. Symbol. This one enable this method enables one to define oscillatory functions of Lagrangian type by defining them as functions of the form pi push forward of mu, where mu is an oscillatory function on z of the type we described above, living on this Lagrangian manifold up on z. The, 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 the examples that I talked about on my first slide. So we got those. Uh, Lagrangian manifolds up on Z. Now what you can do is you can use the pi operation to push these uh, functions down onto X. And that gives you uh, a much, much bigger class of oscillatory functions of isotro isotropic type living on X. Hermander invented this technique, God maybe, 20 years ago or something like that, a long, long time ago. And uh, it gave us a wonderful way of defining a very important class of distributions that come up as solutions of partial differential equations and in lots of other ways um, by this push forward. Okay. So um, I guess I mentioned that um, uh, early in the talk, um, some typical examples of what I call isotropic function, uh, uh, um, oscillatory functions of isotropic type. Let me run that slide by you right here. These are fun and, and pointed out that these oscillatory functions live on isotropic submanifolds of, well, in the paper that Alex and Zokin and I just wrote and just got published about six months ago um, in a sort of a memorial volume for, for Misha Shubin, uh, um, we apply Hermander's technique to isotropic functions in order to define them a much bigger class of isotropic functions than the functions that I ran by you on the first slide. Any questions, comments? More questions or comments? No? Okay. So the next few pages of this lecture, I don't to say this, I can display it on this wonderful screen. The next few pages of this lecture 
Let me see, I maybe I can get the whole damn thing. Yeah, I got the whole slide on here. The next few pages of this lecture, adapting these ideas to define oscillatory functions of isotropic types that vastly generalize these very simple-minded simple, simple -minded oscillatory functions of isotropic type that I inflicted on you at the beginning of the lecture. Okay. So the basic idea in what um, Alex and Zokin and I do is the following. Let me go over this approach we have to generalizing the harmonic uh, uh, techniques and creating this vast class of isotropic fu uh, oscillatory functions of isotropic type vastly generalizes these simple-minded examples that I just inflicted. Basic idea. Yeah. Whole things on the slide. Good. It is possible to, to display these things so that um, you know, the entire uh, uh, slide is on the camera. Basic idea as above, let Z pi X be a fiber bundle over X and H star Z. Uh, the uh, horizontal bundle just before, just as before. And consider on Z isotropic functions of the type I just mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. Let me scroll back and write again the formulas for these isotropic functions that I just talked about at the beginning of the lecture. Sorry. Oh. Huh. Well. Hmm. Oh, yeah. No, not really. Well, not sure where, where they are, but, uh, but I did um, display them to you for, uh, a few minutes ago. Very, very explicit little simple um, oscillatory functions that in, by changing parameters a little bit in, in, the, in the amplitude of the function, forced them to live on isotropic manifolds rather than on Lagrangian manifolds. Now, use the Hermander's technique as follows. Consider functions of that type up on Z. So they're a very special class of isotopes living way up on Z. Now just push them forward via this vibration, a la Hermander, just mimic Hermander. And what you end up with is a very interesting, vast class of isotropic functions of oscillatory type living down on X. So that was our approach. Take Hermander's beautiful idea and generalize it a little bit. So that instead of defining isotropic functions of Lagrangian type, you're defining these, this much bigger class of isotropic functions of isotropic type. Remarks? Any, any? So the idea in, in a little bit more detail, i.e., to explain this idea again, uh, consider functions on Z of the form, this form here, where Z equals Z prime, Z prime prime, and you're making the oscillations happen on the Z prime prime variable. So I'm doing exactly what I, the, I'm giving you exactly the kinds of isotropic functions upstairs that I, ran by you on my first slide. These very simple-minded isotropic functions apply Hermander and push these forward so that they become functions down on X. This gives you a much, much bigger class of isotropic functions. Isotropic functions that Alex and Zokin and I have discovered come up in all kinds of interesting applications, real world, world applications. 
and 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 uh, just so it's it's Hermander's recipe adapted a little bit so that you go from Lagrangian to isotropic. So yeah. what's the, the splitting into Z and Z prime and Z prime prime? What is that on Z? That that causes the well up on C, it causes these isotropic functions to live on sort of a, a manifold that is zero in Z, Z prime prime. Uh, Z prime prime equals zero. So uh, situated on a slightly smaller isotropic manifold of the Lagrangian manifolds that that uh, Hermander considers. Take those things upstairs, push them downstairs, and you get, just as Hermander gets a much vaster class of oscillatory functions of Lagrangian type by this push forward operation, um, Alex and Zokina and I use exactly the same trick to push these functions forward down to, and, and, and we get a much vaster class of oscillatory functions of isotropic type. Can you see the last? What is, uh, let's see the last, that's what you wanted to see, yeah. Okay. So I guess the rest of what I ran by you here in, in uh, slide 10, slide 10, read this stuff here. And then the continuation of slide 10 is this, Z primes being coordinates on X, and the Z, the um, Z prime primes, fiber coordinates and the fibers of the vibration pi. Then the push forward is as in the example side, a function living semi-classically on the isotropic manifold C prime DF X prime equals zero and C prime prime uh, e equal to zero. So it's a, a, an isotropic function that's much, much more general than these isotropic, simple-minded isotropic functions that I inflicted on you in the first slide. Any questions? Yes, Dan. Can you give an, an example of where you need these things? Example, in uh, our paper, uh, yeah, we, we give a lot of nice examples, but. I didn't plan to run a lot of examples by you in this lecture because I have a few more things that I want to describe instead. That's okay? Yeah, yeah. Remark, this is a description of these functions in coordinates, but it's not terribly hard to do all these things much more intrinsically instead of thinking. I mean, instead of using coordinates, you just take a, a general manifold X, a general manifold Z, a general vibration of Z over X, and just apply these. The, 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 the def definitions are sufficiently clean that with a few modifications, um, it's easy to write down coordinate-free examples of these definitions. Okay. <laughs> Well, actually, this lecture is going a lot faster than I expected. Um, it's now only uh, five after 12, and um, I'm, I'm close to the, yes. I'm a bit confused how we are gaming. Just a second. So we took a projection. Yeah. Fiber, right? On the what? From the fiber, we took a projection. Right? <clears throat> yeah, down to the base. How are we gaining more examples? Are there more examples of these things? Yeah, we've been discovering some very, very nice applications. Well, I mean, uh, uh, associatory functions of Lagrangian type, they were introduced by Hermander. And in his beautiful paper where these are defined, he has lots and lots of beautiful applications. Um, anybody ever, here ever read this wonderful classical paper of Hermander's? Any signs of? You all know Hermander. 
at least by reputation, if not. Okay. Um, this is a little embarrassing. I had planned to go much, much more slowly through all this material. Um, I ask yeah, sorry, what? May I ask questions? Yeah, yeah please ask. About this, um, um, isotropy type things. You put the A, uh, H one, one, one half mm -hmm. on this second coordinate. Yes. What, what, what is the meaning of this H one half? Uh, the H is, uh, um, H is just a, a, a real number. Yeah, I, I know, but you, you, you just kind of multiply this to the second of this. I, yeah, so, so in defining the second, uh, the second class of functions, I, I start with functions, you know, well, in, this, in the simple examples, I start with functions that depend on X and X prime. And instead of doing what uh, Hermander does, which is sticking the H on the X, you just stick the H on the second of these two factors. Yeah, I, I, I just looked at that. Why, yeah. why this kind of exponent one half appears in this component? Why, why do you rescale by H to the one half and not say H? <laughs> oh, um, it's, it's just a, a, um, to clean up a little bit, uh, to simplify a few of our results. So I could have done this all with an H rather than an H. But, but in some of our applications, um, we, uh, um, it uh, simplified matters a little bit to make an H to the one half rather than an H. Um, you can decree that, uh, I, I mean, H is a complicated constant, but you can decree that uh, you can replace H by a new H, which is H to the one half. And it's just that in some of our applications, it, 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 it comes out to be, I mean, we have a long, long paper on this subject that contains these definitions. And then the rest of the paper is some nice applications to real you know, okay. Well, so that appears to be <laughs> practically the end of this lecture. Does anybody resent this fact? I mean, it's, it's close to lunchtime. And <laughs> A lot of you are probably dying of starvation and will appreciate having, having the lecture end a little bit earlier than, than expected. But I want to end this lecture by um, mentioning a very, very interesting class of isotopic function of isotropic functions. And these, the examples I've just been talking about so far are uh, examples that have come up within the last couple of decades. It's, it's recent stuff. But I'd like to talk about a very interesting class of oscillatory functions of isotropic functions that have been around in the mathematical literature for decades and decades. These go way back to the 19th century practically. And I'm gonna end the talk by so these examples are what are called um, coherent states. Anybody here heard that word? Ah, good. So some of you are familiar with this. So uh, could you lift that? Sorry, what? Could you lift that page? Oh, I should. Oh, I, I still have. Let me see. What is happening here? I should lift. The bottom part of the page. Uh, so, okay. The, so, okay. First of all, uh, um, page 13. Um, I'd like to conclude the talk. That's page 13. I'd like to conclude this lecture by mentioning, you know, examples that have been around for decades coherent states. And these, these, are, these are lovely little guys. These, these were discovered by mathematicians long before oscillatory functions of isotropic type and oscillatory functions of Lagrangian type made their appearance on the scene. Dan?
Um, okay. 15, here is the example. Let AXH be a Schwartz function in the variable X having an asymptotic expansion of this form. Okay, no, I, I didn't write the functions down. So here's the prototypical example of an oscillatory function uh, of uh, a coherent state. Okay. That's all readable. Um, the prototypical example of a coherent state is an oscillatory function of this type where the H inverse is applied to the variable X minus X naught. So as H tends to zero, this function becomes more and more concentrated at the point X naught. Stare at this and see if you agree. Yes, it's very clear, Professor Gilman, yeah, good. So that's the prototypical example of a coherent state. Um, this is a, 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 an oscillatory function that as H goes to zero, becomes more and more concentrated on the path at the point X naught. And in fact, it's concentrated um, semi-classically at the point X naught, C naught, where C naught is the derivative of the function F at X naught. So semi-classically, as a function, semi-classical function. It's sort of coming closer and closer to the point X naught, C naught as, as H tends to zero. Well, these functions um, have been in the mathematical literature since the 1890s. Physicists discovered these functions and discovered that by applying quantum mechanics to these functions, you are getting results that are very close to functions you get in classical physics, in which uh, you're studying, uh, uh, you know, in classical physics, trajectories in the cotangent space uh, of some a Hamiltonian vector field that start out at x naught, c naught, and then, and and uh, these well, so remark. These functions have lived semi-classically semi on the these exist on isotropic manifold consisting of a single point x naught casino, and are traditionally called coherent states. In other words, when you apply quantum mechanical uh, techniques to these coherent states, you're studying the classical physics of these trajectories in, in the cotangent space that start out at point X naught, C naught. And as they move with time, they, they, they're moving along this trajectory, trajectory. And in the quantum mechanical analog of this, the solution of the Schrodinger equation or whatnot, beginning with these oscillatory functions, that, you know, these, these coherent states is a coherent state that moves classically, according to the rules of classical physics, along the trajectory in the cotangent space of the manifold that starts at the point X naught, C naught. And uh, the, uh, um, the, the, the vector field involved is a vector field associated with a Hamiltonian function. And these are descri describing the classical physical analogs of the results in quantum mechanics, uh, I'm concerned with uh, um, functions uh, um, depending on H bar, uh, Schrodinger functions, and things like that, whose symbols are these Hamiltonian functions that I'm describing uh, at, at the tail end of this <coughs> tail end of this talk. Well. I must apologize. I, I was planning to blabber a lot more about the items on this slide, but uh, uh, um, I thought 
maybe not such a great ideal. The, uh, I'll give a, a more sophisticated talk in which I just simply point out all these remarks that I, I, I have made. But I would like to conclude by saying a little bit. So this conference is a conference in, in uh, honor of uh, um, Kurnishi. That's what this conference is all about. As far as I can understand, that's what this conference is all about. A sort of a tribute to Masaki, a, a tribute to Kurnishi. Well, uh, um, I had a lot of wonderful personal experiences with Kurnishi. Uh, um, I, um, after I, I, I wrote my thesis um, at Harvard in, in the early 60s with Shlomo Sternberg, uh, and uh, then um, shortly thereafter got a job at Columbia as, as a whatever, not an assistant professor quite yet, but a, and a, a, a postdoctoral position at, at, at Columbia. And uh, I got to know Kurnishi. In fact, uh, he and I bonded, became very, very close friends. And during the three years that I was Columbia at Columbia, I, I ben, benefited a lot from this friendship. For instance, he, he would frequently have, he and his wife would frequently have me and my wife uh, over for dinner nights. And um, we went frequently to uh, talks down at uh, uh, NYU, taking the subway down and took talks together and, and uh, um, organized talks up at Columbia as well. I had a wonderful three year uh, um, association with Kurnishi. And uh, when at the end of these three years, uh, I left Columbia and, and uh, took a job at MIT, uh, stayed at MIT for the rest of my life, but uh, um, uh, I still kept a lot in, 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 in contact with Kurnishi for years and years and years. And uh, he died about four years ago. But I have the fondest memories of him. He was an absolutely wonderful person. And uh, he was also a wonderful mathematician. And uh, I am delighted that uh, we're having this uh, memorial conference for him. End of lecture. And do you have any questions? Nope. Oh, here, here's a question. Anybody else have any questions? Yes. Uh, you and your work because you said it's, just, just, it's moderated by physics. Thing. Yeah. Listen, I, uh, yeah, yeah, say it again. So you're considering these classical limits? For the, the you mean these, these results where um, formula and quantum mechanics become as h bar tends to zero theorems in classical physics. Do you also consider complex No, I'm just considering real, uh, real C infinity Hamiltonian so that I can talk about the uh, Hamiltonian vector fields associated with these real C infinity Hamiltonians. So then my understanding is that um, coherent states are very rare. So these coherent states to repeat are, are, are quantum states, but they're living on uh, isotropic submanifolds. Of, or the coherent states are actually living at single points in the coherent. So like a generic state would be decoherent? And the what, what? A generic quantum state would be decoherent? Not a generic quantum state. Uh, so these are a very special class of quantum states. But uh, among other things, there are theorems to the effect that, that every uh, um, quantum mechanical state can be represented as a superposition of these guys. So these, these um, very simple 
quantum mechanical states play an incredibly important role in physics. And in particular, you, you do this, you represent a, a complicated quantum state as a superposition of coherent states. And then what is happening is you're trying to say, solve a Schrodinger equation for these, you start with an initial data being such an object and try to solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation uh, uh, um, using uh, this initial data. You break this initial data up into a superposition of coherent states, which are living on single x, x naught x naughts in the cotangent plane. And then what you can do to solve the Schrodinger equation is reduce it to a classical mechanical problem where you're trying to figure out the trajectories of these x naught x naughts as, uh, as functions of time. Uh, is that too obscure or does that sort of begin to, to uh, explain why this superposition theory makes a lot of sense? Any more questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, let's uh, thank Victor. Wonderful. So um, it's, it's only uh, 12, uh, uh, 25, so we'll be able to get to lunch in time. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, you can. I mean, their micro support are uh, uh, um, isotropic manifolds up in the cotangent bundle. And you solve the Schrodinger equation at time t. The solution is again uh, an isotropic function. And the, uh, the isotropic manifold with figures is just simply you, you take the classical flow associated with the symbol of the, of, of the corresponding uh, um, you know, quantum mechanical object. And then you just you, you flow out the uh, uh, isotropic at time t equals zero and get an isotropic sigma t at time t. And that is, and the, and the solution to the Schrodinger equation in time t is going to be an oscillatory function, which at time t is living on that. So it's a, it's a neat business. Well, uh, I haven't even begin, begun to think about those things. I mean, the whole pure, uh, point of this business is, is you know, um, something that's been around in quantum mechanics since the very beginning, reducing a lot of um, quanta, quantum mechanical problems to, you know, problems in classical mechanics. It's a beautiful, beautiful topic that, uh, that you, you yeah. all have probably gotten yeah. some yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. I mean, you, 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 once you can talk about the micro support of an oscillatory function, something up in, in, in the cotangent bundle, then you can flow out, you can apply fast classical physics to these objects up in the cotangent bundle, flow them out and, and find the solutions of the Schrodinger equation are living at time t on the flown out object. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I,